Thank you. Thank you. It's a noisy world, isn't it? Fact. There are more people alive today than have ever died. And uh, naturally, there's all this tech all around us in every area of life. Most of it comes and goes. Um, let me ask you this. How many apps do you have installed on that phone in your pocket right now? Uh, 50, maybe 100. I know I do. Here's a better question. How many of them do you use? And here's an even better one. How many of them will even exist in 10 years? Today, the world is deeply divided. Uh, for many, this is a time of objectively unprecedented prosperity, comfort, safety, and stability. For many others, anxiety, depression, economic concerns, and a general feeling of uh, doom and gloom permeate every area of day-to-day -day life. But let me give you a glimmer of hope. What if the most disruptive technologies of the next decade won't be the ones with the best code or the most powerful algorithms, but the ones built with the deepest understanding of your pain points? Imagine a future where every piece of technology you interact with on a daily basis was designed not just to give you that uh, dopamine hit, that instant gratification, but to, in fact, understand, relate to, and solve the problems you face every single day. The key to making this future a reality is, and always has been throughout history, is empathy-driven innovation. Ask yourself, I mean, this is a nice building. Uh, why have we humans started building anything at all in the first place? How did we end up here in this audience today on a macro scale? So let's go way back. I mean, way back. Since the dawn of time and our species itself, the only truly resilient innovations, the ones that existed and survived long enough to be built upon, were the ones stemming from a genuine need and desire to solve a real world problem that people were facing at that time and to make people's lives just that little bit easier and safer. Think about it. The ability to improve our lives through invention, through manufacturing tools, and through adapting the environment to our needs is a major evolutionary advantage. We all started with a level playing field, but you don't see dolphins grinding League of Legends. And there's a good reason for that. We have this phenomenon to thank for our entire way of life. And the core driver of this innovation, the way I see it throughout history, was, again, that need to solve a real-world problem. Of course, we have societal rewards in place, like admiration, praise, social media following, that amplify that drive even further. We have created that culture that rewards ingenuity and innovation, and it is, at this point, deeply embedded in our psyche. We invented the wheel to help us carry heavy loads further and easier. We then built homes to keep ourselves and our loved ones out of the elements anywhere we chose to live. Next, we got together and built cities and entire civilizations to become stronger and more prosperous as a whole. No other animal does this. Without these and many other innovations, we wouldn't stand a chance of getting to where we are today. As a more modern example, uh, let's say social networks, arguably a failed experiment, exist because we still felt that need to connect and stay close to one another in our new digital environment. But sometimes this drive to innovate everything can be misguided. The whole social networks thing uh, has arguably backfired massively. 41% of teens that are regular social media users self-rate their mental health as poor or very poor. That's not okay. This is a pretty depressing stat all by itself. But see, digital companionship and digital town squares are not viable substitutes for the real thing. And our brains know this. Uh, our psychology did not evolve with this pattern of communication and this amount of information in mind. Now everybody's depressed, of course. But look beyond the end result here, even when it comes to less obvious examples. Uh, blockchain, for instance was 
created to establish and enforce non-repudiation, which is basically a fancy term for saying you can't deny you did something in the digital realm because there's hard proof of it. It's a safety mechanism. It was never exactly designed to be a vehicle of monetary value. And well, now we have a 21st century version of the tulip mania on our hands. But greed is in human nature too, much to Gordon Gecko's delight. Anybody watched Wall Street dating myself here? In any case, we want more and we're never satisfied with the status quo. What you can do with that drive is to turn that passion into something that helps, not harms our future selves. This is our duty as innovators, and the time is now. Again, that's not to say that the underlying technology isn't important. It can play a fundamentally pivotal role. But see, without that empathy component, you can apply some pretty impressive technology concepts to, say, NFTs. And your company and your invention is bound to be gone as quickly as it came to be. That's grift, not innovation. Do not confuse the two. The real value, the real value, comes from understanding the why behind an issue that you're trying to solve. The recent global pandemic is actually pretty illustrative when it comes to that, as it highlighted many challenges that people of all sorts of walks of life have faced throughout the globe. In fact, the pace of innovation and the inflow of funding into these pandemic era startups was unprecedented at that time. One of the reasons behind it is because it was, as one would put it, a target rich environment. And another reason, however, is because entrepreneurs and innovators worldwide themselves felt the issues deeply that everybody else around the globe and people just like themselves were facing, which allowed them to come up with solutions and extrapolate them to the needs of fellow humans just like themselves. From the emergence of virtual and remote care apps to tackle the acute medical staff shortages and the peril of in-person visits to the clinic, to the legalization of THC in many jurisdictions, helping us all chill a little bit better. Uh, I know it helped. mRNA technology, of course, K-12 school meals, robot deliveries, and much more. Innovators and entrepreneurs worldwide is a big part of why we made it through this thing. And more to my point, many of these innovations are resilient. They solve a real problem. They will persist. They will be built upon. And the bored apes aren't. So in the end, a lot of impressive technology, yes, uh, is involved in innovation. But that in itself doesn't guarantee success. It's not even a great predictor of it. Technology is a vehicle to solve a problem and to address a need. You are much more likely than coming up with impressive tech just all by itself to make an impact with a half-baked product that solves a real painful issue. Let's take a step back. In venture capital, we have this very illustrative concept that's called the hair on fire problem. I talk about this in my book, uh, Dreams to Unicorns, and it goes like this. Imagine your customer literally has their hair on fire. It's burning and it hurts. Driven by empathy, you set out to provide a solution. Now, what would be the best solution to this? Probably a bucket of water. That would be helpful. But guess what? You're a startup. You have limited resources. You don't have a bucket of water. Maybe what you have is a brick. Is it a great solution to this? No. Uh, but your early adopter might be willing to take that brick and start rubbing it on their head in the hopes that it might help even just a little bit. So that's your starting point. By observing this behavior, you can conclude that the hair on fire problem is very real. And the need for a solution is so acute that even a borderline awkward one is more acceptable than no uh, solution at all. And see, the best entrepreneurs out there and the best innovators that create something resilient, they tend to look at the problem first instead of falling into a trap of building a solution in search of a problem. Right? That's a shot in the dark. It may work. It may not. And that's your starting point. Use that empathy. Understand the problem. Now, obviously, your brick wasn't the best tool to solve this issue. You need to iterate to improve it. And using empathy as your guiding principle, you can make this process so much more efficient than if driven by pure logic and a road mapping framework like Moscow, which is a real thing. 
Uh, here's how you can do this to either improve your existing solution or even spot the need for something brand new. Real quick though, first, it's important to make a distinction between sympathy and empathy because the two get conflated a lot. Sympathy is when you feel the same as your fellow human. Empathy, on the other hand, is when you understand how they think and feel. So the good news is that you don't have to light your own hair on fire. I'm not saying you can only innovate if you feel the same as your customers do, but you must understand them well enough to spot the real issues that they have before you set out to solve them. Again, the best teams innovate using a combination of that empathy component and a deep, unique insight into the issue that's being solved. And it all starts with questioning the status quo. I want to talk about that. The simple question that you should use is why? In fact, why is the most impactful question you can ask just about anything. Why does this work the way it does? Is the status quo, in fact, the best way to do this? Or is it simply a habit, tradition, expectation, or maybe a, a sign of a yet uncaptured need in the market? It's up to you to determine that. For example, head-mounted mixed reality headsets, or HMDs, are becoming a mainstay in complex surgical procedures. We're talking real-time patient data, integrated patient data into the headset, MRIs, contextual highlighting, eliminating obscured views for the surgeon, and much more, making some complex procedures such as pulmonary, pulmonary surgery over 180% more effective. Here's the thing. No surgeon ever asked for this. They relied instead on the status quo of charts, human assistance, and verbal requests. Instead of asking your customers what they want, observe the behavior. Observe their behavior day to day. And if you must ask anything at all, ask them, why are you doing that? Ask these questions of yourself and your audience until there are no more whys left. Actually, let's consider a very different example. As many of my friends know, I am a car guy. I uh, drive them, I race them, I collect them. One of the most enduring sports cars on sale today is uh, Mazda's MX-5, also known as the Miata. It's cool, it's affordable, and it's amazing to drive. It also almost didn't happen. When the concept penned by Mazda's California-based studio was presented to the Japanese management, and that was the 1980s, everybody was switching to you know, pragmatic, fuel-efficient, SUVs, wagons, that sort of thing. A two-seater sport car, sports car? No way. And that's what they said. They said, there's no way there's a market for this car. In fact, I think the exact quote was, after spending so many years in the U.S., you must have eaten too much steak and have forgotten the delicacy of Japanese cuisine. But Miata's California-based designers, Tom Matano and uh, Koichi Hayashi, noticed something interesting. Americans around them kept repairing small, nimble, yet horribly unreliable British roadsters. There are Brits in the audience. It is what it is. Just keeping it real. Uh, just to keep them going and to keep them on the road. People wanted a fun, affordable, and reliable two-seater. Didn't ask for it, but Mazda knew. By 2016, they sold one million Miatas. This simple in principle, yet nuanced in execution approach, sometimes generates pushback to the tune of, well, but the customers haven't asked for this. Exactly. People are often so accustomed to the status quo that they cannot imagine a different solution, even if it was staring them in the face. One of the moments of true Steve Jobs genius, for example, was in the now legendary reveal of the original iPhone. You see, in 2007, Apple kept teasing the public with three upcoming product releases, a new phone, a new internet communicator, and a new music player. And the fans were already psyched for this. But when Jobs on stage announced, to everyone's surprise, that these products won't be three separate products, it will be one new revolutionary product, the iPhone. That's how legends are made. That was an amazing moment. The people wanted this, but they didn't even know they did. And were so impressed that Apple read their minds. That was a real wow moment. And that's why it's going to go down in history as one of the best marketing ploys ever. 
By using this method, you create something that lasts and something that can even change the lives of thousands to the better. Uh, where are those pandemic era innovations today? The users of virtual care solutions, such as Teladoc or MD Live and others, are about 43% less likely to die from heart disease than people in Canada and the US as a whole. 43%. That's an incredible number. This is not a fad. That's resilient innovation. This and many other technologies go beyond the business case to truly change the way people live, work, and interact. And there's no reason at all why technology can't be a force for good. You know, in fact, it should be. There, I said it. Help others engineer and create and pioneer lasting resilient solutions to critical problems we have no shortage of today. Climate change, access to education, access to drinking water, healthcare, and more. Now, a common misconception is that you have to be an engineer to do that, and you can be, but statistically, synergistic teams of two to three co-founders with complementary skill sets covering each other's blind spots are the best of breed companies out there. So go team up. You can, you can begin right away. Reflect carefully on your day-to-day -day activities, hobbies, studies, personal and professional experiences. What's the status quo? Does it have to be that way? Why do you do things the way you do them? Maybe there's something that you always wish existed to change that status quo. And you can see other people wanting that too. Please don't create another crypto token. We have enough of those. Dream, pursue side projects, uh, such as open source software or something else, depending on your field. Tinker with AI. It's more accessible than ever. These projects may surprise you, sometimes turning into amazing innovations. Many examples exist. Look, in the end, disruptive innovation is not something limited to select few that come from power or some privileged background, despite what the mainstream media would have you believe. Anyone can change the world. So if I'm saying anything is, let's get started. Thank you.